Hi everyone. Um, I will try to provide a very quick, uh, a very quick uh, insight into some aspects on Iron Age urbanism, focusing on how our views have been revolutionized since the turn of the millennium, so in the last two decades. Because we are a bit behind schedule in the session, I will try just to uh, go rather uh, quickly over these points. In the last uh, couple of decades, the development of some large-scale fieldwork projects, as well as the publication of extensive monographs on some key sites, uh, for example on uh, Manchin, Corot, uh, Bibracte or Titelberg, has considerably expanded the corpus of available evidence. Methodologically, we also have seen the increased application of bioarchaeological analysis uh, and the use of advanced remote sensing methods. Uh, this uh, increased application are enabling us to ask new questions and also are, well, and since and through this are providing fascinating insights into various aspects such as diet, mobility, or the spatial arrangement of sediments in relation to their wider environs. Uh, in terms of theoretical approaches, a growing number of Iron Age scholars are engaged in wider discussions on comparative urbanism and exploring the usefulness of concepts such as low density urbanism. Uh, this is just an example of some uh, overviews uh, from the last, uh, from the last uh, 12 years, different edited uh, volumes. There are, of course, many more in various languages. And I have summarized uh, my own views in an article in the Journal of Archaeological Research in 2018. I'm not going here into definitions. I've published this as well in a volume in a chapter in a volume with uh, Lorenzo Samboni and Carola Metzner on Crossing the Alps. Uh, but uh, what is very important always to emphasize when we're speaking about uh, Iron Age urbanization in the regions north of the Alps is that we are here uh, dealing with non-linear uh, models. So Iron Age archaeology in this sense defies uh, any linear evolutionary trend. And what we have instead are different changing and dynamic cycles of urbanization and de-urbanization in temperate Europe. Uh, in the regions immediately to the north of the Alps, the first wave of urbanization with the so-called first city or princely seats in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, BC, but followed by a period of de-urbanization in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, and then a new phase of urbanization, first with open agglomerations, and I will come back to this, uh, and then fortified opida in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. Um, the last decades have provided, uh, as I said, increasing information, not only in the quantity, but also the quality of our data, with new excavations as uh, some key sites. Uh, but also a, a focus on looking at the wider uh, landscapes rather than only the settlement cores. Uh, and this is very important because it has been changing our understanding, understanding the centers in the wider environs, but also realizing that some of the sites were actually much larger than previously thought. And this has been um, possible thanks to the large scale use of geophysical surveys uh, and LIDAR data, for example. Uh, However, in many cases, we are still using conceptual models based uh, on things that were published in the 1960s or 70s, but these models were based on a much more limited archaeological evidence. So I think we still need to catch up in terms of our interpretations. Um, I have worked uh, for quite a few years now on the so-called first seats, the princely seats of the early Iron Age. Uh, and uh, together with our colleagues, we have claimed that these were the first towns of Central Europe developing between the uh, end of the 7th and the 5th centuries BC in an area stretching from Central France to the Czech Republic. Uh, I will not classify all of the sites uh, uh, shown here in the map as urban, but at least some of them I think we have reasons to call them uh, as such. But for me, the, the, more, the important thing I want to emphasize here is that they existed as part as a, of a network. We cannot just look at them uh, uh, individually, but see them in a wider context in order to understand this, this process. And uh, our perspectives uh, about the size have changed considerably. For example, in terms of size, traditionally we thought that this early Iron Age princely seeds occupied a few hectares. Nowadays, we know that several of them were much larger. For example, the Hornibuak at some point around 100 hectares, Bush over 200 hectares, Savis in the Czech Republic over 100 hectares, or Monlasois around 45 hectares. And in this sense, we also need to adjust our demographic models. Of course, it's always difficult to produce these estimates and you need a certain level and, uh, and quality of, of data to try to start proposing models. But for example, for the Honebock and Monlasois, 
uh, current estimates range between 3,500 5,000 people uh, at their height, which is uh, quite a lot, consider, uh, considering that then we, we will need to add populations living in a wider environment, environments, obviously. Uh, these princely seeds which is, has also become evident that while they share certain common characteristics, they are also quite heterogeneous. Uh, for example, in terms of layout, functions, and even chronology, if we look at individual site biographies, some of them starting earlier, uh, others a bit late, and then also when it comes to their, uh, to their end. Uh, Mediterranean imports, uh, which have uh, often been considered a very important element, uh, they are, uh, we, we now know that they are not restricted to the princely uh, seeds and not, also not to the so-called princely graves, but also appear in, in other contexts, which makes it uh, more interesting. And also, I think there is evidence that elites often lived outside the fortified uh, centers, uh, and, um, not always, but at least in some, in some cases. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the terms princely seeds and princely burials. I'm just using them here because they are quite established in scholarship, but that could be a lecture in its own. So here, just uh, quickly to illustrate some points, the Hoynebuak, this um, kind of recreation image that we produced already some years ago, showing uh, some of the new results that the, the, the citadel was actually only one part of a much wider uh, agglomeration, uh, which uh, occupied around 100 hectares with around, uh, with around 5,000 inhabitants in the early 6th century BC. And interestingly, the site later uh, continues to exist, but on a smaller scale. So it's, we, again, we don't have this kind of trend from, uh, from small to big, but sometimes they start quite big and then become smaller later for various reasons. Uh, in the last years, uh, my German colleagues, with their Krause, Leif uh, Hansen and others, have been studying through a large-scale project, the wider territory of the Hoyneburg, where we know that there were uh, uh, many open settlements, uh, uh, cemeteries, but also quite a few hill forts uh, in a radius of around 20 kilometers around the Hoyneburg, which date, uh, as far as we can say, uh, roughly contemporaneously to the large agglomeration of Hallstatt D1. And uh, the excavation at these sites are showing the complexity of them. And we need to look uh, uh, think of them as part of a connected network. It's very likely that this uh, different hill forts in the environments of the Hoyneburg form part of the same social, political, and I would say also ritual system. Uh, in some cases, with the sites uh, having complementary functions, with the Hornibur being the main production and distribution center, the Altburg likely a place for uh, assemblies, and the Busen perhaps as a um, kind of a sacred location for a wider uh, environment. Uh, moving to uh, central France, the site of Bush was probably the largest uh, settlement uh, in the region north of the Alps in the 5th century BC. Uh, have, uh, covering se several settlement areas. Uh, so we are speaking here of a polyfocal center with some areas with increased occupation, but also some very low, uh, low density uh, areas in between. So we have a combination of an acropolis, areas for craft production, and also some rich burials in the surroundings. Uh, but this uh, early process of urbanization north of the Alps was rather short-lived. Um, and this contrasts with what you observe in many areas of the Mediterranean. Uh, the period of centralization was followed by a phase of decentralization. This, uh, this image shows the chronology of the, of the main sites, and you see that uh, most of them, well, they only lasted for, for, for a few generations, and then they came to an end. And in the following period, in 4th and 3rd centuries BC, we see a return to more decentralized settlement patterns, a reduction of social inequalities, and this is also uh, the time, particularly 4th century BC and part of the 3rd, where we uh, have this uh, uh, so-called Celtic migrations documented in uh, Roman and Greek sources, populations of temperate Europe moving towards Italy and the Balkans. And um, well, we'll again, it will be a talk in its own to discuss the reasons for the, for the end of this earlier age princely seeds. Uh, but uh, the important thing is here, it was a rather short-lived phenomenon. And this links to a much wider topic, which is the, the, this, uh, which is the discussion around so-called fragile or failed urbanism. Traditional research on early urbanism has tended to focus predominantly on so-called successful cities or towns. That means urban sites that had long settlement trajectories. But uh, we need to also pay increasing attention to cases of short-lived agglomerations, which only lasted for some decades uh, or generations. And some years ago, I organized a session with Mike Smith, and some of the people here in the room were actually part of that. And the question of persistence, how long did cities last, has already been mentioned in several other talks this morning. Uh, and then um, in the area north of the Alps, we see a new trend. 
uh, towards uh, increased uh, centralization uh, since the late third, third century BC, and in particular in the second and first centuries BC. Um, usually pe people have focused on the so-called opida, these large fortified settlements, uh, but uh, they were not the first towns north of the Alps, as was traditionally claimed, but rather part of a so-called rebirth after a period of deurbanization. I'm using this a concept of rebirth uh, uh, inspired by the book of Pam Crabtree on early medieval Britain. Uh, and this uh, renewed trend towards urbanization took place in a context of a generally favor favorable climate. Uh, we see demographic growth, we see a, a, a huge increase in number of also of, uh, open sites, agricultural sites, increase in production and trade. Um, and first we see a uh, development of open agglomerations and only a bit later of the large fortified sites. And um, one of the most interesting aspects of the recent, of recent decades is that, that the role of open agglomerations has been highlighted. They were often underestimated because there has been a certain uh, obsession in Iron Age archaeology with walls for its fortifications. Uh, but these open sites uh, were very important. They started, some of them already in the 3rd century BC, others in the early 2nd century BC, so preceding, in most cases, uh, uh, the, the opida. Uh, and then when the fortified opida uh, developed, some of these open agglomerations continued to exist, uh, others, uh, others stopped. But these open sites were, uh, in many cases, large production and distribution centers, so the, the most important economic roles were not restricted at all to the fortified sites, and in many cases some of these open agglomerations uh, fulfill more of the um, more of the criteria that we usually associate with urbanism than some of the fortified sites. And um, in this sense, it's also uh, when we speak about the, uh, the, the scale of these uh, agglomerations, both fortified and, and open, it's interesting to reflect on the uh, question of density. And uh, uh, myself and other colleagues, such as Tom Moore, have uh, used the concept of low density urbanism, which has been developed uh, for many years by Roland Fletcher, as an alternative to the uh, high density uh, model proposed by people like Gordon, uh, Gordon Child. Um, low density urbanism has been applied to the Triplier sites in, uh, in Ukraine, for example, uh, but also to, uh, to the Opera in uh, late prehistoric Europe. Uh, the Opida enclosed large areas, but generally present a low population density per hectare. Again, demographic estimates are always complicated, but some, some proposals, for example, for, for munching between 13 to 26 per hectare, and Bibrak 37 to 74, Honeburg around 50. Uh, this is when we speak uh, of, the, of the settlements uh, as a whole, but then we need to take into account that within each of the sites, we usually have some areas with a rather high density and other areas of low density. But as you can see here, for example, the image about munching, the, the, the large fortified area also included uh, quite a lot of open space that could be used uh, for, for, uh, for agricultural purposes, uh, uh, keeping animals, but also in some cases for just uh, aggregation of people for assemblies or things like that, as has also been discussed earlier today for some of the Tripleya sites in Ukraine. And I'm coming to an end here, uh, linked to the, to the previous slide. Um, uh, Tomura and I have introduced this concept of urban landscapes, uh, which is a, a term that we adopt from an earlier publication uh, from Smith in 72, not Mike Smith, uh, another Smith. Um, and the idea here is that the basic settlement units um, in Iron Age Europe were often uh, enclosed farms that resemble rural settlement types, particularly in the early stages of some of these large agglomerations. What we see is a domination of large site by unbuilt space, more similar to farm landscapes than what traditional notions of urban quarters. We see that very well in the early stages of the, of the Horny Book, but also in many of the late Iron Age opida. So what we observe, uh, not in all cases, but in many, is a nucleation of part of the rural population, a concentration of activities that were previously dispersed more widely on the landscape, and we have established some comparisons in a recent article published this year in the Journal of Urban Archaeology, with examples from other parts of the world, such as uh, Africa, West Africa. Um, I will finish with these uh, nice images produced by the German and French College uh, of the Hornibourg uh, and Mont Thank you.